to the Gospel of St. Matthew for my last sermon for vacation, so that way if I do a bad job, I can run out the door and you won't catch me, right? You forget about it. My message this morning is entitled, Greatness in the Kingdom of Heaven. Greatness in the Kingdom of Heaven. I hope it will be a surprise to you. Greatness in the Kingdom of Heaven as we see what the Lord Jesus Christ has to say about it. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, let's all stand up please for the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 17. Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. Now a lot of the disciples thought when the Messiah came, that's what he was going to do. He says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no way pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Beloved, heaven and earth will never pass away. I mean, this old world system will pass away, but in other words, God's Eternal law is eternal. Amen? <clears throat> That's why we believe in the infallibility of the Word of God. Verse 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I the Messiah say unto you, Now the rabbis, he's saying I, is distinguishing himself, because the rabbis and the scribes had taught things that were contrary to the word of God. So when Jesus says, I, I the Messiah say unto you, I'm the ultimate authority who say this to you. He says, I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes were the lawyers, the theologians. They taught the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the separatists. They went out and they preached what the scribes taught them. Ye shall in no case enter in to the kingdom of heaven. All those are pretty serious words, amen? Our Father and our God, as we come before thee this morning, Lord, we know that all is vain except the Holy Spirit of the living God. Open up the eyes of our understanding, Father. Oh God, I pray that you'd help me preach this word with power and authority and clarity and humility and passion and compassion, that I might exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and reach the heads and the hearts of your people here, Lord God, that they too may exalt thee. Father, I pray you'd give this preacher some strength this morning. Anoint this flesh. Anoint me with your Holy Spirit, Lord God. And Father, anoint the word as it goes into the heart of thy saints. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Now, if you know anything about the scriptures, you know that these words that our Lord Jesus Christ spoke were part of the Sermon on the Mount. And after he gave the Beatitudes in verses 1 through 12, if you're following the chapter, and he told his disciples in verses 13 through 16 that they were both the salt of the earth and they were the light of the world. And then he warned them of the dangers of backsliding if that salt was no longer salty. Then in verses 17 and 18, he taught them he'd not come to abolish the law. Now, he's not talking about the ceremonial law. We know that was absolutely abolished at the cross. What he's talking about is God's moral law. Amen? The moral law send up, summed up in the Ten Commandments or what we know as the Decalogue. Say that word. The Decalogue. The Decalogue. Those are the Deca, ten. Okay? And you'll see it many times when you're reading scriptures or you're reading in a study Bible or you're reading a commentary. It'll say the Decalogue, and you know he's talking about what? The Ten Commandments. Okay, thank you, Tom. Good thing you were at the seminary. Because <clears throat> everyone else has to have a clue. <laughs> All right. But instead, beloved, he told them that he did not come to abolish. He did not come to destroy that moral law, beloved. He said he came to fulfill it. Pareo. And it means he came to fill it full of its true meaning, complete moral and spiritual truths, beloved, especially as it pertained to him as that law awaited Messiah who had finally come. Would you say amen out there? And he taught them that God's moral law was of eternal permanence, eternal perpetuity, and that they were under the divine obligation to keep it. Now a lot of Christians are confused about that because there are some scriptures that say the law has been done away and there are other scriptures that say we must fulfill the law. Of course, the law that they're talking about that was done away was the ceremonial law, right? All the types pointed to Christ as the Messiah, but God's moral law transcends both covenants. Would you say amen? God's moral law, the Ten Commandments, as you study Jeremiah, verses 31 through 34, are the very heart and core of both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Would you say amen out there? 
The ceremonial law was how you administered the Ten Commandments under the Old Covenant. In the New Covenant, the gospel is how you administer the Ten Commandments. Wouldn't you say amen out there? Now, the law hasn't changed. In the Old Testament, that law was outward and external. It was written in stone. In the New Covenant, the Bible says that that law was now written on the fleshy tables of our heart by the finger of the Holy Ghost. Wouldn't you say amen out there? Only thing that changed was now it was internalized. Would you say amen out there? And so, beloved, he taught his disciples that God's commandments were holy. And as you read the book, he says they're just and they're good and they're uh, righteous, beloved. And now he expected those who've been born again, those with whom he had given a new moral and spiritual heart, to now obey these commandments, not in their own strength, but now that they were born again and they had the indwelling Holy Spirit in them and the supernatural power of God's grace, they should long to keep the law, love to keep the law, want to keep the law, but bless God, they must keep the law. Wouldn't you say amen out there? Now that doesn't earn you salvation. That's a sign of your faith. Wouldn't you say amen? There's no merit in that. That's what I want you to, I've taught you for years and so I shouldn't have to repeat myself uh, that, beloved. And so why did God want them to do that? Why is Christ saying that this law is so important, that it's the constitution virtually of the new covenant? Let me tell you why. Because that law shows us the qualifying condition of living in the, the kingdom of heaven. Now the scribes and the Pharisees, beloved, Jesus said your righteousness must exceed them. And they were meticulous at what they did. And I'll explain that to you as we go along. Amen? And so, beloved, as citizen believers, we're commanded and expected to obey the law of God because we please God that way. That's the obedience of faith, and it's the highest form. Obedience to God's commandments is the highest form of faith and love and worship to God. A person that says they love God, I really love you, Lord, but will not obey God, they're a liar, and the truth is not in them, the Bible says. He that says he loved God and keeps not his commandments is a liar, 1 John 2, 4, and the truth is not in him. Now that's a powerful statement, isn't it? And this was by John, who was uh, the beloved, who leaned on Jesus' uh, breast. Now throughout Christ's ministry on earth, beloved, his disciples were always jockeying to have and hold high positions of rank and honor in the kingdom of heaven. For example... Uh, the Bible says James and John besought Christ to let them sit at his right hand and his left hand in the ki coming kingdom. What did Jesus do? He sternly reproved them and told them those high-ranking positions were not his to give, but they were the Father's to give, predicated upon how they lived in the kingdom of heaven. Would you say amen out there? In other words, God the Father looks down and says, they're living holy, they're living righteous, they're living just, they're living according to my word, they're great in the kingdom of heaven. Would you say amen out there? And then he tells you what position you're going to have. Other disciples wanted Jesus to give them authority to rule and reign over the church, to rule and reign over the kingdom of heaven on earth. But again, Jesus firmly reproved them, saying that only the uh, saved Gentiles sought dictatorial rulership over people like this. Now, folks, the fact is, the pride of man always seeks greatness. The pride of man always seeks preeminence. Most men long to be respected. They long to be revered. They long to be admired by others. They want to be leaders, beloved. They covet people's attention. Now, I'm not going to ask you if that's you, but a lot of people are like that. In fact, some people get jealous of someone who's in position of leadership. But let me tell you this. This is from my lips to God's ears. I hate being the center of attention. As I joke around and everything, I'm really introverted. Can you believe that? I love being alone, uh, and I don't say that uh, uh, to say anything to my, my wife for 50 years. That was last Sunday, right? But I, I, it is what it is, and God is the one who calls you and puts you in that position. And I think that's why God put me, because I didn't want to be there, and he had to change my heart. <laughs> I don't want to be in leadership anymore. But anyways, beloved, the pride of man is always coveting to be the center of attention. So they seek fame and fortune. So they seek notoriety and celebrity. So they seek primacy and preeminence, beloved. Why? To feed their self-esteem and their ego. Why did they do it, preacher? To feed their sense of self-importance and thinking that they're so unique. I'm different than anyone else. That's why God saved me. And don't tell me you didn't kind of feel like that. I must be something special. See, it's our pride. We all have it. Why, beloved? 
to feed their sense of uh, their own pride and their self-delusion of being superior to others. Why is that, Pastor? To try to make them think that they're really someone who's special and gifted, that they're really someone who's talented and exceptional, that they're really someone who is different than everyone else. I am unique. I am different. Bless God. That's exactly what the New Age uh, uh, cultists teach right now in boardrooms, and they teach their people, I'm unique. I'm successful. I'm, 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 I'm. Feeding their pride. Amen. And God said, you want to be lifted up with me? You need to humble yourself, boy. <laughs> Amen? You need to humble yourself if you want me to exalt you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying in their self-deception, in their arrogance, they want to impress folks into thinking that they're a cut above everyone else. So they're a superior rank, so to speak, or class or status in life than that average person. So therefore, because they're like that, then you must see me as being someone special. Amen? But let me tell you something. The only one who makes you special is God. And he even makes the unsaved man special, beloved. And he says, that's your heaven on earth. You won't repent. You better enjoy every second of this. Because when you go to hell, there'll be nothing but burning, boiling, bubbling, pain, and suffering. And so we can't be too big for our britches, can we? We need to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord so he'll lift us up. And then our Lord Jesus, in verses 19 and 20, deals with greatness in the kingdom of God. Now, before I preach this sermon to you, I need to explain a few terms so you can understand this. Now, normally you don't learn this till you go to seminary, but it's imperative that God's people know this. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom with all thy getting, get understanding, Proverbs 1.7. So I want you to get understanding, because Jesus uses this term, kingdom of heaven. Now the phrase kingdom of heaven is used only here in Matthew's gospel. The other three gospels, Mark, Luke, and John, they use the term the kingdom of God. But, beloved, both the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are synonymous, yet there is a slight difference between them. Let me explain to you what it is. The kingdom of God is the sovereign and supreme rule and reign of God throughout the universe and over the earth and in the lives of men, especially those who are saved. Whereas the kingdom of heaven is part of that kingdom of God. It's the spiritual kingdom that Christ brought down from heaven uh, and set up on this rebellious earth to bring sinful fallen men back into harmony with the kingdom of God and the rest of the universe. The only part of the universe that has rebelled has been earth. So Christ brought the kingdom of God where? Down to earth, or the kingdom of heaven down where? But they're both synonymous, only the kingdom of heaven is part of that, what? Kingdom of God. You understand that? I hope so. Now, beloved, the kingdom of heaven is the sphere of Christ's sovereign and supreme reign as God as king on earth over the spiritual realm, over the hearts, over the lives of believers. But hear me now. Don't miss this. You can read, you can read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But at the second advent, the kingdom of heaven on earth will merge with and be swallowed up by the eternal and universal kingdom of God from heaven as, and as 1 Corinthians 15, 28 says, Then shall the Son also himself be subject unto God, that put all things under him, that God may once again be all in all. So Christ came to this earth to bring this rebellious earth back into complete harmony and unity with God in heaven and the rest of the universe, beloved, once again, so God could be one in all, one, once, and he could be God over everything, once for all, like he was before earth fell. Pluto does exactly what God wants it to do. Mars does exactly what God wants it to do. The, the galaxies do exactly what God wants them to do. But God put man on this earth with a free will who did not do what he wanted to do, so he sent his son to bring us back into harmony with that. How much love is that? How much mercy is that? And so someday, beloved, there'll be the kingdom of God will swallow up this new heaven and this new earth. Amen? So the church. Now, where does the church fit into all this? Now, people get confused with that. The church is the visible manifestation of the invisible kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven on earth. Right now, look around you. Take a quick look, peek, okay? The church is both visible 
and invisible. It's visible in that we can see who's in the church, amen? But the kingdom of heaven is invisible. Only, God may look down on this church and say, you know what, there's 10 people in that church that aren't saved. But we look at them as they're what? Now the church is the visible manifestation of the kingdom of God. We preach the word of God. We talk about God. So if people want to know about the kingdom of God, they look to the church. The church is the body, bride, building of uh, Christ. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, there are three salient truths we need to truly understand about how Christ deals with greatness in the kingdom of God. The first thing I want you to see, and I'm going to belabor this point, is the endangered in the kingdom of heaven. Now, beloved, I want you to look at verse 19a. He says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so, he should be called least in the kingdom of heaven. These least people are not seen as great in the kingdom of heaven. They're seen as dead weight in the kingdom of heaven. All of God's commandments are of vital importance, but there are some commandments that are weightier and of more importance than others, and thus they are, uh, have a heavier penalty for violating them. Now, beloved, Christ here is speaking to his disciples. Disciples who know that the violation of all God's commandments is sin, but there are some sins that are worse and more deadly than others. For example, the penalty for murder is greater than the penalty for anger. The penalty for adultery, that's a soul-damning sin, is greater than the penalty for cussing. The penalty for drunkenness is greater than the penalty penalty for jealousy, and so forth, beloved. In other words, the Bible teaches major sins and minors. The, the, the Catholic Church, they've got it wrong in the way they interpret it, but they say there's mortal sins and venial. The Bible teaches there are major sins and there are minor sins. And uh, uh, in other words, you could be a jealous person and still go to heaven, but you're, not, you're going to be saved so as fire. Uh, what I'm trying to show you is this, beloved. That the same is likewise true of man's law. For example, the penalty for murder in man's law is greater than the penalty for speeding. Amen? The penalty for kidnapping is greater than the penalty for theft. The penalty for rape is greater than the penalty for perjury and so forth. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees and the rabbis, knowing this, had meticulously organized and categorized God's commandments into lists. Lists they considered important to obey uh, and those that they deemed were unimportant to obey. And they falsely reasoned that obeying the greater ones would assure you of heaven, you do this, you're going to get the glory. Whereas disobeying the least of the le less important ones was but a small sin, it would not affect your salvation. You see, folks, they thought that obeying the greater commandments was a must to be saved, but obeying the least of the commandments was optional and of no consequence regarding one's salvation with God. But I want to tell you this, they were wrong. I'm just telling you a fact of what they thought. If you look it up and you will see that's what happened. Now sadly, many Christians also have this type of deluded mentality and mindset. I see it all the time as a minister. Any minister that stands behind the pulpit if he's a man of God who knows the Word of God, who teaches the Word of God, who rules over the people of God, sees this all the time. A lot of people look at God's commandments as a sort of smogosburg, whereby you can pick and choose which commandments you want to obey and which you uh, don't want to obey, beloved, or disobey, depending on which ones you consider are important or unimportant in regards to your salvation. In other words, you say, well, this one's easy for me to obey, but that one there, I'm going to have to change my lifestyle. For example, I had a woman say to me, Pastor Joel, I know, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Sabbath is indeed for today. There's no denying it. And I said, well, praise the Lord. She says, but I do my banking on, Sab on Saturdays. I said, what good is it for you to gain the whole world, lose your soul because of your banking? Who gave you that money to boot? The Sabbath is to commemorate God as the creator, the redeemer of the universe, the provider. He gave you everything you have. And it's for your benefit to rest and relax. No, preachers can't rest on the Sabbath. Uh, but I ask God to help me do it even as I'm preaching. <laughs> Fall like a dish rag back here, right? But anyways, beloved, so they try to obey the greater ones, and cavalierly, what do they do? They overlook 
and they ignore and disobey what they consider to be the least important ones that won't affect their salvation. Let me give you a classic example. I see this all the time. I've gone nose to nose with I can't tell you how many people, and I can tell you this, beloved, and I say this honestly, truthfully, they were wrong, I was right, because the Bible was right. For example, in 1 Corinthians 2.9, you can look it up. Write it down when you go home. I always say to you to do what with me? Check me out. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9, women are instructed to adorn themselves, listen, in modest apparel. Cosmios catastole. Modest apparel. What does that mean? It means that they're dressed in a chaste and reserved and covered up way. That they're dressed with loose-fitting clothes and attire, befitting of a Christian woman who is to glorify the Lord and not herself. Now, the Bible's clear on that. So, beloved, they're not to dress immodestly or seductively in tight-fitting clothes to cause men to lust after them. God gave us three great natural instincts. The spiritual instinct, Satan corrupted that. They seek God. The survival instinct, Satan corrupted that, and men murder one another. But the sexual instinct, to, to fulfill the dominion mandate for man to repopulate the earth. Wouldn't you say amen out there? So Satan takes that, beloved, and you know what he's done through sex throughout the world, and I don't have to go into any detail because we have children here. But anyways, uh, what I'm saying to you is for a Christian woman to dress immodestly is sin before the Lord. Why? Because it not only violates God's commandment, but it also fills a man's heart with lust and puts him in hell, and God now holds her to blame for it. Why? Because God told her not to do it, and yet she did it anyway, because she wrongly considered this is the least of the commandments, and God really doesn't care how I dress. But God does care how you dress. It's what we do outwardly, how he rewards us. Would you say amen? Or how, what we do outwardly is why he punishes us. But, you know, a lot of this is the least of the commandments, and I look good, and everybody else is doing this. And look at the culture. Beloved, the church, the Bible says the church is counterculture. We're supposed to be raising their standard, not dropping ours so we can adopt theirs. See, we're the ones that are salt of the earth. Jesus says right in the chapter, you're the light of the world. But if the salt has lost its savior, what good is it for men to throw that on the ground and tramp it underfoot? God says it's nothing. You've lost your saltiness. And you lose your saltiness, you lose your soul, by the way. You hear me now. And so in doing this, beloved, this woman, Christian woman, she now not only jeopardizes, jeopardizes her own soul and salvation, but why is that, Pastor? Because she refused to submit and surrender to the lordship of God, to the lordship and authority of his word in the kingdom of heaven who was the cause of that man to sin and perhaps lose his soul. But why did she do it? Because of her pride. But why did she do it? Because of her vanity? Because of her conceit? Why did she do it? Because of her vain glory, her desire for attention. Look at me. Look at me. You see, folks, in her self-deception, she reasoned that she could disobey the least of God's commandments with impurity. That God doesn't think that what she's doing is actually that bad. You see, it's only just a little sin, and it really won't hurt anyone, so I'm going to do it anyways. Now, you know, you know I'm telling you the truth. You know that's exactly what women think. You know that. And that's why pride was the number one sin that made Satan fall, and that's why Satan always tries to get uh, at our pride to cause our pride to do these things like that, so we'll fall too. So the woman falls right into the trap, just like Eve did. Adam wasn't deceived, the Bible says. The woman was in the transgression. Adam died to save his wife. I'd have said to the Lord, give me another one. Bye. <laughs> You're on your own on this one, baby. <laughs> you see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this, that she's dead wrong. Why? Because she tempted man and greatly offended God. God says to all Christian women, I want you to dress modestly to glorify me. But in their vanity and stubbornness, they say something like this. I want to show off my nice figure with my skin-tight clothes. I want to wear tight, low-cut blesses and shirts and tank tops cut down to there or here. <laughs> I want to uh, wear short, tight dresses and skirts and shorts and pants. I think I look so good in them, but God says, not me. Listen to me now. God says, that's the attire of a harlot. 
I don't say it. God says it. Wouldn't you say amen? When the children of Israel would walk along the side of the road and they'd, uh, uh, if a man had lost his wife or whatever, the harlots would be sitting there, their skirts up to here, cleavage showing, all kinds of makeup, everything like that. And the guy didn't look at it and said, boy, she looks like somebody I'd marry. Uh Uh-uh. How much? Like Judah, I'll give you a lamb in my ring. (laughs) Okay. You see, it's a power, sex is a powerful instinct that God built into man, and Satan corrupts it. And it's not a least commandment, beloved, it's a great commandment. Uh, but, you know, Satan's a wily foe, isn't he? But God says, you look like a harlot to me. You're not glorifying me, you're glorifying yourself. And so, beloved, and worse yet, Christian women who dress with snug-fitting clothes like this also teach their daughters by their bad example to also disobey God and dress immodestly just like them. And now they too dress just like the world. And now they too look just like the world. And now they too glorify the world. And now they too are condemned along with the world. And so when preachers stand up week after week, beloved, you know, I, I can't put you in an arm lock and force you to do it. Either you're going to read your word and believe it, or you're not going to. I've tried to be as faithful as I could. Like I'm sure a lot of good pastors are trying to be as faithful as they can to the sheep God gave them. But this is the word of the Lord, not the word of the pastor, the word of the Lord. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, it's a sad fact that the daughters, you more is caught than taught. They see mama dressing like this, they dress like this. In other words, beloved, now they too bring great reproach to God. Now they too disobey God's commandments. Now they too highly offend Him, beloved. Now they too adore and admire themselves. They don't admire God, beloved, not God. And yet Christian women with stomach pride and defiant hearts just don't seem to care about this. But, beloved, they should care and they must care because it, it's going to uh, uh, count as far as them abiding in the kingdom of heaven. So, see, we, we've done with the Pharisees. Then, well, that one's important. No, that one isn't so good. Well, we, God wasn't care about that. I can do this one right here. Now, you become a judge of the law, right? Is that what God says in James? You're, you should be a judge of the law? Or judge, God says if you judge the law, you're what? By the law. Condemned by the law. And so this is his kingdom. It isn't my kingdom. I must conform to his laws, not, not him to me. And yet we've made a man-centered gospel in the church. Now, beloved, I want you to look at verse 19a. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so, he should be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I need to explain this to you. The word least, illac histos, here is used in two different ways. Number one, it is used in regards to God's commandments. It means the seemingly smallest and unimportant one. That is, hear me now, from a human perspective. In other words, the ones we deem to be trivial and insignificant because they appear to be lowest in rank and status of all of God's rules and laws in the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, we neither obey them nor teach them. Now hear me. Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where to get bread. Amen? The Bible says, the things that thou hast learned among faithful men, I want you to pass that on to other faithful men. In in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we see four generations of men having the word of God being passed down. I've tried to pass it down to my son. I've tried to pass it down to my daughter. I've tried to pass it down to my grandkids. I've tried to pass it down to my preacher boys. Pass it down, pass it down. That's how you keep the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ alive, amen? Not by great big screens on the uh, wall, not by all these gimmicks. That's man-centered, beloved. The Holy Spirit's not in that one whit. It is preaching and teaching, preaching and teaching, preaching and teaching, obeying and teaching, obeying and teaching. Amen? Would you say amen? So, beloved, I want you to get this. You must first obey them before you can truly teach them. And if you don't, you are a classic hypocrite. You're someone who never intends to be what you pretend to be. Would you say amen out there? For example, some consider, as I've talked about, having dress standards. I'm talking about men also. Some guys walk around like Harry Belafonte. They got three hairs on their chest and they got the shirt down in here. Deo, de deo. 
Daylight come and I want to go home. Oh, please, Mr. Tallyman, tally me banana. Yeah. One here. <laughs> yeah. Look at me. You see, beloved, what am I saying? They consider having dress standards as being of least importance in the kingdom of heaven, but they're wrong. Some consider the doctrine of separation from unbelievers and religious apostasy as being least in the kingdom of heaven, but they're wrong. Let me give you a plastic example. I'll do this quick. They just had a prayer march down in Washington, D.C., amen? We need to pray for our country. I hope every Christian prays for their country. But I want you to see this. God says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, right? Don't you get yoked together with unbelievers like that. Now, look, watch this. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Herodians, and Jesus Christ did not like Rome ruling over the Jews. Did they have a prayer meeting, even though they all believed different men, hold hands and say, we're going to reach the same God? Did they do that? Uh-uh. Why? Because God says, you hang around with this person, you're going to end up uh, believing just like them, or you're going to overlook their sin, you're going to overlook their error, you're going to overlook all of that. So what we had in Washington was everybody praying. I'm glad people are praying, but believe me. But what was, you had Catholics with the unbelievers, with the uh, United Methodists, whatever. And beloved, listen to me. Jesus said, if you're not born again, you're not a true Christian. Amen? Amen. And Jesus said, I can't hold hands with the charismatic. I can't hold hands with the Pentecostal. They might be in the kingdom, but they're wrong, beloved, in their doctrine. And they're teaching a lot of people wrong. But, see, we all got a common cause. I've taught you before, during World War II, both the Americans and the Germans hated the rats, but they didn't join hands to fight them. This is what Satan is trying to do for that one world ecumenical church. And yet so many Christians have shelved their brains. Oh, isn't this wonderful? Well, beloved, you ought to look at it from a scriptural perspective. How do you think God looks at it? I'm going to listen to that Catholic that's praying, who's praying to Mary as co-redemptress and mediatrix. Is God going to do that? It's an affront to my son. So you can see what's going on, beloved. We're supposed to separate from religious apostasy, and it's not popular. And people get mad at that, and they get mad at any preacher that teaches that. But that's the word of the Lord. Would you say amen? It's not something that we make up. Some consider keeping the Sabbath day holy as being one of the least of God's commandments in the kingdom of heaven, but they're wrong on that. Others consider paying their tithe and offerings. Well, you know, we've been in this COVID-19 virus, and we don't have to pay our tithe and offerings right now. Beloved, you listen to me. I want to give you, I'm not trying to tap myself and my wife on the shoulder. I was in the hospital when this all went down. First thing I said to my wife, I said, make sure you pay our tithe and offerings this week. Malachi 3.8 says, will a man rob God? And they said, how are we robbing you, God? In tithes and offerings. That first 10% is mine. I don't need it, but it shows me where your heart is. And I'll make that 90% supernatural, and you'll be like 120%. But many Christians have stopped paying their tithe and offering. I'm not going to church, so God must understand. You should be sending it in. And I'm saying that for us, beloved. I thank God we have a tithing church. I'm trying to teach you the principle. Amen? The tithe is not mine. The tithe is the Lord's. The offering is what I give over and above that. The offering is not the ceiling. It's the floor where I start. But the first 10% of my gross income belongs to God. God says, it's mine. The first fruits of your increase. Now let me ask you something. Does God say that, yes or no? Okay, you know he says that. I'm not blowing smoke at you. So uh, a lot of people consider that. And and then, uh, beloved, there's many other things that I won't go into. All that to say that in these things they do greatly err because they are all very important to God, but because we consider them to be inconsequential or unimportant to our salvation and standing with God, we carelessly and foolishly choose to neither obey nor teach them to others in the kingdom of heaven. How can you teach somebody to give their tithe and offering if you're not tithing and offering? They're watching you. I taught my children right from the get-go. When my kids were small and we started giving them allowance, I'd say, Kobe, Roy, and Nikki, I call her Snickers. I'd say, Roy, Snickers, the first 10% of this is God's. Whose is it? It's God's, Daddy. You sure? Yes, Daddy. I says, okay. Now the offering is what you give over and above that. I said, Roy, <laughs> you wouldn't have anything if it was for God. <laughs> Kobe still owes God a lot of money. <laughs> but you see, beloved, I was trying to pass it on to my children. Pass it on. I don't know when Christ is going to come again, but I want a church here for 
children. I want it here for my grandchildren. I want it here for your children. I want it here for your grandchildren. How's about you? Amen. And you believe me when I tell you, it's no easy thing for the devil. The kingdom of heaven arrayed, uh, the kingdom of darkness arrayed all around it and trying to get a hold of its leaders. You see, beloved, we do detriment to our own soul when we don't keep God's commandments because they're essential in the kingdom of heaven. In James chapter 3, verse 1, the Lord's half-brother said this, My brethren, be not many masters or teachers of the law, for greater is your condemnation, stricter is your judgment. In other words, I try to give it to you straight up. I know you get mad at me. That's not what I think. Of it. And I understand that, beloved. But you're not coming from the scriptures. You're coming from your feelings. Because I know that God will put me to task on the day of judgment. You didn't teach what, Joel? You said what? Because you wanted people to like you? Uh-uh. You know, beloved, I told you, we started with four people, my family. And if it ends up with four people, but it'll be four people who want to follow the Lord. Amen? And I hope that's where you want to stand too, beloved. Now you hear me. Further, to neither obey nor teach uh, them to others, beloved, shows the true proclivity and bent of a person's heart to the things of God and what you really think about him and his laws and his kingdom. And folks like this are of least importance in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because they have a very low view and love of God. Because they have a very low view and love of his commandments and in the kingdom of heaven. They have a very low view and love of the necessity of the obedience of faith. Doesn't the Bible say in Romans twice it says in chapter 1 and chapter 16 that it Paul preached the obedience and the faith so the Gentiles could come to the salvation that the Jews uh, had. Uh, so, beloved, that's Bible. But a lot of people don't read their Bible, and they don't take it seriously, and they don't try to memorize Scripture, and so they just kind of go along to get along, and if it feels gucci goo, it's, it's okay. You can't run your life on your feelings, amen? So that's the first way that word least is used. In the second place, beloved, the second way is this word also means to be looked upon, now listen, as least worthy in and of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, it refers to those who literally gamble with their soul. How so, pastor? By willfully defying, willfully disobeying the least of God's commandments and refusing to teach them to edify others, beloved, the soul of other people, and also to protect their salvation. There's a lot of jobs easier than this. But it's my job. Dave and Phil, so they can teach Ashley, and they can teach G, because G have a hard time with this. But, but you see, beloved, and their grandchildren, and their grandchildren, so our job is to not only live it, but to what? Teach it. And so a lot of Christians don't want to live it, and so therefore, when they try to teach it to their kids, the kids kick up the heel and rebel. I see you, mom and daddy, you don't do this, you do that, you're a hypocrite. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if they ever said that to you. But you've got to be consistent in your walk with the Lord. Would you say amen out there? And your job is to teach others to protect their soul. Is it right that I teach you you can fall from grace to protect your soul? Amen? Is it right that I teach you about the kingdom of heaven, about being born again, about justification, sanctification, propitiation, glorification? Why? So you can save your soul. Is it right that I do it? Oh, yes, it is, beloved. And so whether you consider them the least or the greatest, you see, beloved, you've got to set aside. Where is the mind of Christ? We have the mind of Christ, the Bible says. And this mind must be programmed with the Word of God. Would you say amen out there? Be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. See, we have to be transformed. A lot of people don't want to renew their mind. Well, I feel this way all the time, and that's the way I've always been, and things can't change. Well, you better change. You can get yourself in deep trouble. And so, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this here. God sees and considers people like this as not being worthy of the kingdom of heaven because in his sight they are rebels who teach rebellion in it. So they're at the bottom of the barrel in the kingdom of heaven. That is the lowest on the total pole, so to speak, teetering between being saved and lost, heaven and hell. And if they repent, beloved, they'll be saved yet so as by fire, as it says in 1 Corinthians 3.15. If they don't repent, beloved, I wouldn't give them a dime for their salvation. But if they do, God says they'll be saved yet so as by fire. Imagine being standing before God, no rewards, 
and looking at your life, didn't want to obey God, didn't want to follow God, didn't want to live for God. You just did your own thing. You're saved by the skin of your teeth. That's what the Greek there literally means. But the words least in the kingdom are used here, beloved, another way. It does not mean that those who knowingly do all this will just hold the most menial and trivial jobs in the kingdom of heaven. That is a gross misinterpretation of the text. How do we know that? Because verse 20 shows us that it means they'll not finally enter in to the kingdom of heaven. You see, beloved, these least endanger their souls. Why? Because they're willfully disobedient in the kingdom of heaven. They're willfully defiant and rebellious in the kingdom of heaven. They're poor examples. They have a poor testimony. They erode the kingdom of heaven. They do not edify people in the kingdom of heaven. Well, Pastor Joel, how come you're giving that tithe and offering? How? People say to me all the time, Pastor Joel, how come when I see your wife out in public, she's got a skirt on or a dress? Now, you folks have ever seen my wife in public? How come? Because she's trying to dress as a woman. Why? Because Satan likes, loves unisex. He tries to confuse the sexes. Women wear long hair. Men wear long hair. Women wear jewelry. Men wear jewelry. Women dress like a man. Man dresses like a woman. But God says, I don't want to confuse the sexes. Why? Because homosexuality, transgender, all of this is to confuse, confuse the race so man could not repopulate the earth. If you took all the homosexuals, put them on an island, beloved, that would die out, right? And if that was the earth, that would be it. They'd be dead. But God made man and made woman, beloved. They'd leave, cleave, conceive, the Bible teaches. Amen? Well, I'm going to roll my adrenaline run. I better finish. <laughs> Okay, um, so beloved, in other words, what I'm saying, they do this to the peril of their own soul. So they're not great, but least in the kingdom of heaven. They're not great, but they're unworthy and unfit for the kingdom of heaven. They're undeserving of the kingdom of heaven, and they endanger their souls. I want you to hear what Jesus said in Luke chapter 16 and verse 10. Jesus said, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is also uh, unjust in much. And we know in Revelation 22, 11, that no unjust person will ever enter into the kingdom of God. Read it. Okay, so it's pretty serious business with God, but we don't want to follow the words. We don't want to obey it. And I say we, I'm probably talking to the choir here. But a lot of people who write me see this. Oh, we all just love one another. We just get along. Yeah, in other words, you don't want to be in the battle. Okay, and you know what? Neither do I. <laughs> I'd love to be able to put down my sword for a week. But for the last, praise God, 44 years I've been wielding it. Or 45 years. It's not an easy task, beloved. So that's number one, the endangered in the kingdom of heaven, beloved. They don't take the commandments of God serious, nor do they teach them. Number two, and I'll move right along. The exalted in the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 19b. He says, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, beloved, I want you to notice what God thinks of the doers and the teachers of his commandment in the kingdom of heaven. He uses the word great. That word great is the Greek word megas. That is, they're thought of as highest in rank and recognition by God in the kingdom of heaven. They're thought of as being highest in dignity and honor and respect and regard and status in the kingdom of heaven by God. God puts them up on a pedestal, so to speak. Would you say amen? You see, beloved folks like this are highly admired, esteemed, and exalted by God. And therefore, they're considered by him to be altogether worthy, altogether deserving of the kingdom of heaven. Why, Prastler? Because of their virtue and integrity and upright moral and spiritual life and their full compliance and conformity to the commandments of God as required in the kingdom of heaven. You see, beloved, they're doing all the necessary requirements and conditions of the kingdom of heaven. Though salvation is by grace through faith, beloved, there are conditions to grace. Does grace say I must repent? Is that a condition, yes or no? Does grace say I must believe? Does grace say I must confess? You see, these are necessary prerequisites, requirements to be in the kingdom of heaven. They're not works of merit. You can't earn your salvation. Amen? Does, does the grace say I must be baptized? Yes. Does grace say I must obey? Yes. 
So people look at grace as a license to sin, and God just goes like this. He flips up the rug and puts everything under there. But that's not the Bible, Ellie. I mean, uh, Ellie. <laughs> Folks, <laughs> I love you, Ellie. <laughs> okay, that's not the Bible, beloved. I, uh, in other words, I'm saying it's vain to teach God's commandments without first doing them. The doing must precede the teaching or you're a hypocrite. If a person's example cannot be safely followed to be saved, beloved, then it would be terribly unsafe to ever trust his words. Amen? Citizens in the kingdom of heaven must live. They must abide like that holy place they're going to requires. When I was in the military, I had to do what they told me to do, beloved. If I didn't, I'd be in Leavenworth still. Believe me, you don't... If you ever went over the hill in the Marine Corps, you'd still be in Leavenworth, okay? You don't go over the hill in the Marine Corps. To the ends of the earth, they sent men to uh, track you down because they're considered that elite force. You know, <clears throat> in the Great Commission, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Did you hear that, beloved? To teach them to observe what? All things, meaning all things, whether they're the greatest or the least of God's commandments. Oh, hear me now. Greatness in the kingdom of heaven is not based upon your gifts. Greatness in the kingdom of heaven is not based upon your service or your giving or your education. Greatness in the kingdom of heaven is not based upon your praying or your philanthropy, beloved. It's not based upon your ministries. It's not based upon evangelism, as good and needful as these things are. Hear me now, don't miss this. Greatness in the kingdom of heaven is determined by your submission and surrender to God's commandments. Would you say amen out there? Greatness in the kingdom of heaven is determined by your loving obedience to God's commandments. It's determined by your living in harmony with and conformity to God's commandments. Greatness in the kingdom of heaven, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me now, is determined by your rightly handling and teaching of God's commandments to people. Would you say amen? Listen, beloved, you can have 10,000 people in a church, and that won't mean anything to God. You can have a church with five people, and God says, that's a big church in my sight. That's a great church in my sight. God never called us to be successful. He called us to be faithful. Amen? Preach it. Preach it. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The time is coming and they shall not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry, he told Timothy. Paul told Timothy. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 through 6. Preach the word, preach the word, preach the word. Not your feelings, not your psychology, not your emotions. Preach the what? Word. Preach the word. Come on and say amen. Now, beloved, listen to me now. You don't have to do anything spectacular or extraordinary to be great in the kingdom of God. A lot of people think they do. I don't have a great ministry. I don't have great service. Oh, beloved, you hear me now? All you have to do is just daily obey God. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, all you have to do is reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Savior, and yield yourself unto him. Amen? God says, you do that, you're great in my sight. Hey, I can do that from my living room. I can do that from a chair. I can do that from my bed. How about you? You know, beloved, God says you want to be great. I'll tell you how to do it. Live to glorify me. Glorify me in the way you look. Glorify me in the way you speak. Glorify me in the way you dress. Glorify me in the way you act. That's how you do it. You're changed. You're a Christian now. Little Christ is that word. Would you say amen out there? You know, beloved, the Bible says in Micah 6 a. listen to what he says. He says, what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? But I love what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 2. He says, but to this man will I look, this is God speaking, even to him that is of a poor, contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. Do you tremble at the word of the Lord? Huh? Because it's the authority of God. Amen? 
God says, I'll look on the man that trembles at my word. Beloved, I can tell you this. When I stand behind this pulpit, I tremble. It's not, and I've done it for so many years, but I still, every time I come on, oh God, put your hand on. Oh God, let me speak your word. Oh God. Because I know I'll give an account of it someday. So what am I saying to you, beloved? I'm saying greatness in the kingdom of heaven is not determined by your gifts or your successes in life. It's not determined by your popularity or by your reputation or even by your works. But how much you loved and obeyed God's commandments, how much you tried to conform your life to them, how much you taught others to keep God's commandments. Oh, listen to me, beloved, listen to me, don't miss this. If you just do this, then the Lord Jesus Christ says you will be great in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? We all can do this. Amen? You say, well, I'm big man. You don't have to be big. We can all do this. Lord, you're my Lord. I submit to you. I surrender to you. You tell me where to go. You tell me what to do. Now, a lot of people tell you where to go, but don't listen to them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and lastly, beloved, and I'll just wrap it up. <laughs> I'm going on vacation tomorrow. <laughs> I always got a coat hanger. He's going to hang me up like this today when I go home. The excluded from the kingdom of heaven. I want you to look at verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness, your right doing, shall exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, dikisone, which is that word righteousness, and the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter in to the kingdom of heaven. Beloved, the scribes and the Pharisees had a legal and an outward righteousness of, or conformity to God's commandments, but they did not have an inward, imputed, and imparted righteousness to justify them before God or sanctify them in their life. They didn't have that righteousness that comes through faith that works by love. Would you say amen out there? If the Holy Ghost lives inside of you, he's constantly urging you not to be more like the world, but to be more like Jesus. Would you say amen? Be more like Christ. You're a little Christ. You see, beloved, only this type of righteousness that manifests itself in your personal righteousness, a righteousness that lives a holy, righteous, and godly life in conformity to God's commandments, is necessary for God to allow you to ever enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus knew that. That's why he spent so much time. Paul said to the Ephesian elders, he says, for three years I taught day and night with tears trying to teach you this. Read the book of Ephesians. Read, and then read uh, 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 Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, when he, we have to rebuke the church at Ephesus. But notice the words he uses here. Jesus says they would no case, ume, that's that Greek phrase. There was no case, ume. And that word ume is a double negative, strengthening the denial. It means this. It means no, not ever. No, not never. No, by no means will they ever enter in to the kingdom of heaven. In other words, they'll be barred. They'll be banned. They'll be excluded from the kingdom of heaven because of their disobedient faith. God will look at them as being an alien. Lord, but I worshiped you. I taught in your streets. I don't know you. Get away from me. You know, if you, if you just say and do not, you're nothing but a hypocrite, amen? That's all you are. And so God says you didn't meet the qualifying conditions. My grace gave you all the strength that you needed. My spirit gave you all the strength that you needed. But you didn't want that. No, you wanted to live like the world, and you wanted to go do what the world does, and you wanted to dress like the world, and you wanted to have everything that the world has. But, beloved, I'll tell you, as a Christian, it's not a daily increase, it's a daily decrease. You hear me now. You know, I can honestly say this. You know, I'm, I'm watching, I'm trying to follow the news, and everybody's talking about cell phones and everything. And I'm, I'm not against cell phones, believe me. I don't own one. But they were saying how they're going to get all your information on you and they're, they, you know, they're taking pictures of you. I said, not me. <laughs> you know what they say? Joel who? Wait. Okay, let's look up this information he's got on the internet. Well, there's nothing there. <laughs> I got four phones. I don't want another one. Now, the day may come when I need one, but it'll be with weeping and tears. <laughs> I don't want to have a, an addiction, beloved, an addiction. The greatest addiction in the world is not opioids. 
It's not even alcohol. You know what it is? It's your cell phone. And you get up in the morning. You sit down to eat. No, most of you write it. But mommy, you tell me, people addicted? You tell me. And if they are, beloved, I want you to tell me who is behind it. I end my case. What have I taught you this morning? I taught you three things. The endangered in the kingdom of heaven, the exalted in the kingdom of heaven, and the excluded from the kingdom of heaven. We all want to be the exalted in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Let's go to the throne of grace.